What's the big idea? Okay, and we are live. Welcome to a, another edition of Volleyballgy. This is uh, Zuby, and today I am on my own uh, for a special episode where we uh, answer some uh, questions from uh, Volleyball Moms on Facebook. There's a Facebook group called Volleyball Moms. If you haven't heard of it or uh, been a part of it, it's a pretty handy group. Lots of sharing going on, of course, lots of comments, and there's lots of comments about the comments, but... Um, Overall, it's a great place for, for moms to ask questions, so we thought we would field a few. So I've uh, pre-selected a few recent ones that have come through, and I'm just going to uh, answer them uh, more or less on the fly, I guess. Uh, but they are pre-selected, of course. We didn't want to scroll through and uh, bore you with all that. But uh, So we hope you enjoy this episode. It is uh, Zuby or Volleyballogy Answers uh, Facebook group uh, volleyball moms from facebook i guess is what i'd call it uh so uh first question i'm not going to name names for people's uh, privacy obviously but uh first question we'll start simple uh this will be my daughter's first year of volleyball and this mama doesn't know where to start i know she needs shoes uh so she asked about which one are the best ones to get her and any pointers on playing well, I think uh, if it's your daughter's first year of volleyball, uh, my first recommendation would be uh, for you as a parent just to understand that it is a uh, topsy-turvy kind of uh, crazy journey. Uh, all rep sport, I think all youth sports are now. Um, and if you can be uh, patient um, and very supportive of the idea that your daughter needs to have fun in everything she does, then that's a pretty good guiding principle. A lot of us parents get caught up in, uh, you know, the coaching, the club, uh, you know, the image. Um, but I think the number one thing to focus on is if your daughter's enjoying playing, then that's the place to go. And if your daughter enjoys a coach or a group of people, that's the place to go. It might not end up that way. Uh, a lot of seasons start out very positive and, um, don't end up very well for various reasons. Uh, a lot of politics, a lot of, uh, you know, I, I think the biggest, one of the biggest threats in the game is the, the, uh, a lot of people think it's the parents and that's for sure there, but I think a more common problem is the coaching, uh, and, and coaches who want to win so early that they forget that youth sports are about building people. And, uh, again, making sure that every kid enjoys it and grows as a person from the game, you know, the skills will develop, uh, as long as the kids are learning to be good people and, and developing good character. And in fact, I think it's, it's vital that kids understand that they need to have great character to become great players. You can't separate those two ideas. So um, I would just say that, you know, focus on your child's enjoyment of the sport. Um, be very supportive uh, of her and her wishes. Uh, if she doesn't want to do it, sometimes uh, parents end up uh, pushing their kids into sports. So just be careful with that. Um, and also don't get caught up in competitive and comparisons. That's, that's a huge thing. Uh, don't compare your child to other kids. Again, their life story is totally different. Their genetics are totally different. So, um, keep that in mind that it's actually, you know, fruitless and, um, you know, your kids are already learning to compare themselves to other people too much because of social media. So, um, it's very important that you don't, uh, keep, you know, reinforce that idea in your child's mind. Cause you know, comparison is the road to disaster, right? Uh, doesn't matter who you are. If you start comparing yourself to other people, you'll never measure up and it'll be lead to a very, uh, unsatisfying life and journey in volleyball. So that would be my recommendation. Um, you know, and pointers on, on playing obviously is just, you know, you know, enjoy the game and part of enjoying the game is developing skill. I think it's hard to enjoy volleyball. I think, uh, uh, if you're not developing your skills, especially in the competitive situation of school teams and club teams. So uh, make sure that, you know, she uh, is seeking out good coaching and quality coaching in your area. Uh, the private lessons can be useful as long as the private lessons have more than one kid in them. I don't think one-on-one -on -one lessons are super great unless you're working on a very specific aspect. I think it's always better to have drills with three or four participants participating. That way you can work on multiple facets of the game and uh, working on skills and isolation in volleyball is not really a good way to go. You want to sort of get the, you know, bumping, setting, hitting, serving, all, all in the same drill as much as, as possible. In my opinion, I think it makes for a more realistic thing versus a coach just tossing to a hitter repeatedly. That's not a re really great way to learn it. So, uh, so yeah, those are tips. I'll try not to spend so long on, uh, on every answer. Um, 
Up next, we have an anonymous uh, post here. Again, we're not naming names, but this was posted anonymously, I'm guessing because it is a problem. Uh, so bear with me while as I read this. So uh, this poster writes, when going to all these tryouts and seeing the competition at her position, I'm at a loss on what to do moving forward. We've been getting invites to come back from clubs after initial pre-tryout, but not with the coaches and or teams that we would like our daughter to be on. It feels like these coaches are staying with their successful squads and are only looking for bench warmers. Uh, I also think these clubs are wasting our time and money uh, for us to try out so they can fulfill player quota of the new and poor performing teams. Uh, with all that, I thought a couple of scenarios. Uh, one of them, this parent is saying, is maybe they should take an offer from a club to be on their new or low ranked teams pay or sorry this is one thing that could happen pay lots of money in club dues hope uh to e have either a good or decent season or could be bad and in all of this no change in player development from the previous season a uh, second option for this parent is maybe they should take the club season off because of the situation play competitive rec or competitive sand uh, recreational league or competitive beach or sand use that money you were going to pay with club on private lessons with recommended uh with recommended coaches to improve skills and come back stronger for club the following season. Any other suggestions? Okay, so this one is loaded with a lot of what ifs and a lot of unknowns, and I would submit to you that that is the beauty of sport. Um, and the number one thing I think you need to do in all of this, I'm trying to see if there was an age mentioned here. I don't see it. Um, um, yeah. Uh, I think the number one question you have to ask yourself is ask your daughter, you know, what does she want to do, right? Because, you know, the idea that there's a, a yes, I understand the problem. We, we did an episode on this a few episodes back. If you haven't seen it, maybe go check it out. It's about the problems with early re-signings. Um, I think that the problem with them is that they, they, they take all of the competition and vital aspects of competition out of tryouts. I mean, tryouts are there for even returning players to prove that they deserve a spot. And uh, I can't believe that we're living in an era where coaches want to take that out of the game. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would just uh, hope that um, that's something that we can, that, that, that maybe it could address this. But in your scenario, it sounds like they're re-signing everybody. Uh, but there's no guarantee that the second team or another team of, full of lots of players in the gym are going to be lesser, by the way, right? Like, um you know, if you get a, if you get the right coach and the right group of players, and again, if that team is focusing on character and development of players and having fun, uh, those teams can can surprise a lot of a lot of teams. I, I know a story personally of uh, there was a group of girls that were like this was at uh, eighteen year old, seventeen year old group of players who all were cut by a club team, and didn't make the team, you know, and they went and formed. I uh, joined another just starting up club. So everybody assumed it would be a crappy club that was just starting. Uh, but the right coaches came in. All of those girls joined that team and they destroyed that other team. <laughs> they, they, so they beat the team where they were all rejected. So, I mean, you know, I don't think there's any guarantees in sport. And I think that's the beauty of sport. And I think that, you know, asking your daughter what she wants to do is a great first step. And go with the fun option for her, right? If, if there's some adventure here in being an underdog or not being on the number one team, but you're still, I've seen tons of number, you know, number two teams where the players develop a ton. So it depends on who the coach is, the vibe of the, of the gym. That's a huge one, by the way. Send your daughter to tryouts. And if she doesn't get a good vibe on the court from the coaches or players, trust that gut instinct. It's very, very uh, real. Uh, it doesn't mean that the season won't end crappy if it feels right, but it, it, but it, it's more likely that she'll have a better experience. Uh, but of course, I'm also, you know, we've talked a lot on the show about beach volleyball. We have a few episodes on, on the benefits of beach. Um, you know, I'm always in favor of players going to the beach and developing. As If you live in an area that has beach all year round, uh, I would highly recommend going out to the beach because the beach is unique. And I don't know, again, your daughter's age, but you get to work on passing, setting, hitting, serving all the time, digging, reading, right? Reading is the, the number one thing. I think that beach players come back indoors and everything feels like it's slow motion indoors because you are reading everything and you're learning to watch the player, not the ball. So that's always a great option too. Uh, but again, I think it has to start with you asking your daughter and then going from there and not underestimating indoor um, 
you know, secondary teams. Cause a lot of times they, you know, the clubs do re-signings for, for security reasons, right? They're, they're worried about losing players. So they want, they don't want to offend them by not offering them a spot. And on the other hand, the players are insecure about losing their spot. So they re- we're in this weird cycle of uh, insecurity where clubs are doing re-signings, players are accepting them. And then, um, you know, they, they miss out on uh, new potential players and, the, and they don't teach those players the, the benefits of, of being nervous in a tryout. Like, I, it'd be fascinating to see what happens. Like, you know, if a, t- if a player goes through their whole club experience getting re-signed, 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 and then they're put in a situation where they have to do a real tryout in post-secondary school, uh, I'll bet you that player will collapse, you know, mentally because they, they aren't used to that stress and pressure. So, yeah, so that's what I would do. Uh, ask the daughter see what she feels, go to tryouts, see how that feels. Um, and, and if her, her answer is beach, then go for beach and then mix in some private lessons if you want. But I would submit to you that beach is all you need uh, to develop an all-round player because when beach players go back indoor, they tend to dominate. So just food for thought. And I did both, by the way. I'm not, not just a beach player, so I played beach and indoor. And I just, coming back in uh, after uh, beach season was always like, you know, jumping two, three inches higher and just uh, everything felt so much easier indoor. So... Okay, uh, next question. We have a question uh, about a 12U player uh, going into her second year of club. She's good, uh, but uh, lots of room to improve. Of course, she's 12U, so keep that in mind. Uh, We are moving from a house to a townhome and space is more limited. Any suggestions for good at-home practice gear? that she can use when space is tight. Okay. Uh, you know, 12 U players, I mean like lots of room for improvement. Of course, that, I just want to tell parents, uh, that the, the, the great players at age 11, 12, 13, 15 are almost never the best players at age 25, uh, 24. So, you know, I, I find when parents make these comments about lots of room for improvement, I, I, I tend to get a little defensive because I mean, like, you know, we, we apply our adult mental states and our adult work ethics to our children, uh, not remembering what we were like when we were 12 or 11. So I think it's very important that parents don't do that. Don't project your current self and mindset and beliefs and aggressiveness or whatever onto your child. I think that's an unhealthy thing to do. Um, I think you have to understand that like anything worthwhile, it's a long process to success, to real success, whatever you define it as. And if you are or we are um, you know, impatient, like, which, you know, I'm sort of sniffing out a little impatience in that comment. Um, then I can guarantee you there will be no success because, uh, the difference between great and, you know, non-great or un, you know, unsuccessful is the patience. Uh, it's a little bit of work every day. Um, it's not about comparing your child to other kids on the court. Cause again, that's useless, right? There can be superstars at 12 who are not going to be superstars at 15 and 25, like I said. So uh, the idea is to compare your child to him or herself at that age. Uh, Are they uh, doing things the next day that make them better? And don't forget that the number one thing that makes a young kid better anyway is making sure they're having fun. Because in the early ages of sport, if a kid is not having fun, then they will definitely quit. And they won't succeed because, you know, one thing that happens, like I I can speak to this in a business sense and in my volleyball career was that uh, for a certain point I was driven and then especially in business and even in, in, in volleyball, there comes a time where you have some success and then you're being dragged. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, success leads to almost, uh, a little bit of a trap because you know you you're so driven in the beginning and you work really hard and you're dedicated and then it becomes it hits a stage with all of our passions where the passion and the success that we've had in that field kind of leads us to being trapped in a certain box where we have to keep going keep going keep going so if you don't have love in an early stage of your you know interaction with the game then you're going to um definitely quit because, you know, people say follow your passions and that's a lovely thing to say, but it's not really true because your passions don't, and you you end up not, you know, the the things associated with success in your passion often aren't just the passion. So in other words, you know, if you are a baker and you love baking, uh, if you open a bakery, the last thing you're going to do that leads to success is baking. You're going to be doing all sorts of other things around managing a store or a bakery that, um, you know, 
you, you need to develop the work ethic and, and the work ethic only comes from joy. So remember that like the number one thing that a young kid can get to improve is fun. Make sure they're having fun. And the minute it starts to sound like work, so parents, coaches, um, we need to monitor our words and our tone and monitor the feeling in practice. If you're running it like it's an NFL uh, combine uh, for 12 year olds, or your parents are making you, you know, you're, you're making a kid work out at home. I think there's something wrong there because unless the kid really wants it and, and be careful because sometimes the kids will tell you that they want something, but really what they real they, they absolutely want is your approval and they're reading that you want it. So, you know, I had that discussion with my daughter. I told her like, listen, I'm going to love you if you don't play volleyball, you don't have to play volleyball to make me love you. Yes, it is my life. It is my business. It's everything I do 24 seven, not just volleyballology, but also other businesses that I, that I operate. But I said, that's why I'm sick of, like, you could argue I'm sick of volleyball. Like I talked about, I'm kind of being dragged by volleyball at this stage of my, of my life. Um, but so I have enough volleyball in my world. I don't need you to do that. And then, you know, that took the pressure off her and she understood that, that, you know, dad's love is not contingent on her playing volleyball or any sport. Uh, of course, I want her to be physically active and that's very important for her mental and physical health and she gets that. Um, but I think that's very important that parents be very careful with the words they use and understand that, you know, well, what do you want to do is a great question to find out early. We may not like the answers, but it's better than finding it out, you know, 10 years later. Uh, or thousands of dollars later when your kid resents you for making them do something that they didn't want to do. So, um, and remember, we can't make people do what they don't want to do. You, you can, they can fake it for you, but that's not very productive and helpful. So, but if you are, if your daughter's into it and she wants to improve and she loves and not loves the idea of working at home, you know, I think body weight stuff is all you need to do. Um, like stability stuff, one-legged lunges, um, squats, push-ups those are those are great exercises old school exercises that are the hardest ones to do by the way i think yoga is very good for young kids because it helps align a lot of things increases flexibility and let's face it that flexibility a lot of people overlook flexibility's role in strength um, if you are flexible you will have greater strength and even in volleyball in terms of whipping motion movement um flexibility is massive. So that's what I would do if I were at home. And then of course, you know, if, if you're talking about ball skills, I think there's lots of opportunities to get out, get on the beach, uh, get involved in uh, community volleyball programs. That's a good place to apply some things. But I think if, if you want to do some good body weight stuff for youth, um, you know, some exercises like that, strength training that's good for balance and coordination. Uh, and it can even help them grow better if there's some muscle. We know this now that bone density is kind of, you know, muscle training. The old thing, the old story was that weight training affects growth, but it negatively, but we know that's not true. It's actually the opposite. Like some good uh, strength training, like yoga, by the way, is strength training, uh, can support growth uh, as well too. So, you know, I think those are just good natural options that aren't going to be too, um, too difficult. And again, if the kid's on board and loves it, that's the key. Uh, okay, uh, on to the next one. Um, do any of your girls uh, have volleyball profile or have a volleyball profile for college coaches to see? If yes, where do you create one? Thank you for your help. Okay, so I looked at the responses to some of these before just to see what parents were writing about. And of course, a lot of them are about private, um, you know, companies that offer these things. But I'm just going to tell you that, uh, you know, after we, ha we had an episode on recruitment uh, with a, with a post-secondary coach, Shane Christopher, um, I'll tell you right now that, that, you know, it's like anything else. If you, if you just want to do some legwork or your child wants to do some legwork, it's very easy to be seen for free. So like I do tell parents like, you know, if you're, if you're fighting for attention, um, then that's, you know, they, they, a lot of coaches will know about you probably already. If you're in, in the, uh, echelon of kids that will get accepted or, or have an opportunity to play post-secondary. But if you are in a small area or remote area and you feel like you're not being seen, I think one, uh, very important thing that you can do is, you know, just get your daughter to create an Instagram, um, you know, social media pages, um, e even TikTok pay like for specifically for volleyball um and then i think you know think about where you want to go to school academically i think academically and and campus fit is massive like we, we're in the process now of my daughter is going around checking out campuses and we said to her listen you got to pick the campus that feels best before you um, decide on where you want to play you can pick a school for the team if you want but um 
if the school isn't right, like the bulk of your time will be living on campus, going to class. And, you know, I think volleyball can be, you know, uh, it's kind of like overriding people's lives and they don't even know what varsity, like as someone who played post-secondary, um, I know that it's kind of a crazy schedule and I know that when I played, it was ages ago and today it's even more treated like a professional thing. So I do tell my kids, pick the campus where you feel best first. Uh, Obviously, if you want to play varsity volleyball, you got to make sure they have a varsity team and then reach out to the coaches, right? Email to the coach, a YouTube video, a highlight video, um, sending again, links to your Instagram or whatever, uh, putting up, um, I think, you know, full rallies, uh, not, not too long of a video because coach's time is very precious. Um, you know, and, th- and that's how you do it. I think it's, there's uh, the free way uh, is always, I think the best way. And I think, you know, it, you can pay for something fancy and you can pay for a profile and, um, not have it get the results. Um, and I think that you can, the, the more direct approach, like every coach I, I know, uh, post-secondary coach always says like, you know, quick email, uh, with a link to a YouTube video is fine. Uh, show me all the skills that that player needs to have. Um, and like I said, the video no longer than like, you know, five, 10 minutes tops. You know, they don't want full matches. They don't have time for that. Um, but, but make sure every rally, it may be the rallies complete, you know, rather than, you know, just to see how your player impacts rallies. Um, and that's it. That's all you need. Just, uh, and you know, you can tag, Tag those coaches, tag the, those varsity teams often have Instagram pages too. So you can also tag them in posts. Um, that, that's a good way to get seen. But the best way is right in that coach's inbox with a link to some some real real play. And then an invitation in that email, maybe to where you're going to be in the next little while for some tournaments and, and they can come out uh, and watch. And most coaches in a local area, they, they try their best to go out to see people, especially if they're intrigued by the video. Obviously, that's the first step. So, uh, so yeah, that's what I would do. I think the free is best. I don't think you need to pay for any fancy profiles. Um, up next, um, Please tell me how you pick a club if you get more than one club offer. Uh, does club matter for college recruitment? Okay. So I think, again, uh, number one step, uh, ask your child's feel. Okay. Like if you've raised a child to speak up and, and, and uh, you know, talk about how they feel about things, uh you know, within reason, right? Um, then you should really trust their gut on the court. Like, do you like the do you like the players here? Do you like the coach here? Do you like where they're practicing? Do you feel good in this gym? Uh, for whatever reason, th- that's a very important question to ask your player. And it's also good to teach your player to ask themselves these questions because a lot of times they go off, follow their friends or they go off, follow the logo on the jersey or the image of a club. And, you know, my daughter did that. We let her try it. I knew she was uh, picking a club that had a reputation uh, pub- among players and parents that was good. But personally, I knew a lot of problems in the club, you know, in terms of mindset and uh, arrogance, I would say. Um, but I let her do that. And then we talked about, I talked about it before and I talked about it after. And she ended up leaving that club, switching to another club um, in, in the season because of problems. And, and it just, um, you know, I didn't tell her, I told you so, but I did tell her to reflect on the idea that, you know, there's more to this than the image of a jersey. She was only like 13 at the time when she did that thing and she wanted to play for that club. And, um, you know, often, you know, those clubs can rest on their laurels and ride their coattails from years prior. And they don't put in the effort and the work because they it's easy for them to get the coaches. It's easy for them to get the players. So what happens to anybody when things start to come easily or there's like a lot of success is people let their guard down and they lighten up a little bit and they, they don't try anymore. So um, I think the field of the player in the gym is huge. Uh, who that coach is, you know, if you have a coach who's talking about winning at all costs versus a coach who's talking about growing the individual, these are massive red flags for parents and players to listen to uh, because the player, the coach that's worried about player development and character and growth and whether they're all good teammates, uh, those teams tend to win in the long run anyway. And two, that means that your kid's going to get from sport what they should get, which isn't about going pro or, you know, going to uh, college or whatever. Uh, It's about becoming a better person because that's where the bulk of players are going. That's the bulk of the experience they're going to get from club volleyball or high school volleyball. They're going to get the life skills, right? A very small percentage go to post-secondary even. I forget about pro, right? So, um, 
And I think that's how you pick the club, the vibe, the feeling you get. It's kind of like buying a, a home. You know, a lot of people walk into a home and they can tell, or they walk into a neighborhood and they go, we want to live here. There is that same thing with uh, your gut will tell you as a parent, will tell you as a player, um, even as a coach when they're trying to pick a, a club. Your gut tells you a lot and we tend to ignore the gut and or tell us a story, and, you know, tell ourselves a story that overrides the gut. Uh, but listen to that because that, that tells you a lot. When you get a bad feeling about something, that means you see you're, you're maybe you switch or go to a different team. Um, and does club matter for recruitment? I think so. I think that what I mean is like there's some areas and it varies from where, where area to area. Like in our area, club is everything. That's where the, the bulk of coaches will go. They will also go to high school teams in our area. And I think other, there's other areas where high school is the key one because – you know, a lot of NCAA schools, they, they focus on the high school system because they figure it's organized, it's easy to track, whereas club is kind of the Wild West, uh, depending on where you live. Like, there, there can be a club sprouting up every few weeks, and it's hard to keep track of where players are, I think, through the club system, but the hope is that they're all in the high school system in some areas. So um, I think, I think personally, the reason why I think club and high school matter is because I think it's all about reps and touches and different formats, like, or different... Um, different uh, experiences for your child. So for instance, in our area, like, you know, your daughter or uh, your son could be playing club and they could be, um, you know, a mediocre player on their club. And then in high school, they might be a star and, and it could be the reverse where you are. But the, the it's very important for a player to go through both of those uh, scenarios, I think, or, or to experience maybe playing a different position because their high school or club team needs them to do something differently. So I think it's new players, it's different uh, scenarios. And I think it's just more touches. At the end of the day, the people who play most tend to be the most successful, right? Like anything in life, the people who do it more tend to be better at it. So whether you're a writer, an athlete, um, you know, a business person, whatever, uh, doing the people who do it most tend to do it best. So volleyball reps and touches matter. So I would say... Um, you know, if you're going to get recruited, you're probably just going to want to play more, regardless of where uh, recruiters tend to find players in your area. So, yeah. Um, up next, I have a question about what to do. A varsity coach also coaches at a local club. She is telling players uh, if they do not play at the club she works, that she will not keep them on the team in high school. What can be done about this? The players are so conflicted because they love their current club but feel the threat of losing out in high school. So, oh boy, she's telling players that if they do not play at the club she works, um, that she will not keep them on the team in high school. Wow, that is, that's brutal. That If that's exactly as it's being presented, then that is, uh, I understand familiarity and I understand coaches who say like, you know, I get it. You know, if I work with you here, it'd be handy to work with you there. But, um yeah, that's, uh, that's really, that's really brutal. Uh, and it's such a conflict of interest and it shouldn't be allowed. And that coach is, I'm sorry to say a loser because they don't understand what sports about. They don't understand that sports is about, um, you know, uh, not, not forcing kids to do things. It's about kids having fun. There's a coach who's making it about them. And those coaches, uh, have really missed the point that like they, they are so misguided in uh like you know the point of sports is to make kids have fun and to make kids better people that's it and if you act like this you're already you know modeling some toxic crazy behavior um and putting your needs ahead of the the kids so i i just can't stand this stuff and i you know you hope it's rare but sadly uh we know it's not and it's uh you know that the, as as more players play volleyball because it's growing massively, uh, there's inevitably going to be a shortage of good coaching. And it's very easy. I mean, we're going to have a, a great guest on our next episode that you're going to want to tune in for. A uh, legendary coach is going to join us. And we're going to talk about this problem of it's too easy to become a coach. If you want instant respect, you can just walk right into youth sports coaching, right? There's no test. There's no, you know, other than criminal background checks, there's no you know, there's no test, there's no course to take. And the problem is that the minute you put a course on it, um, then you're probably going to turn people away from it. So what happens is you get these insecure people who want to walk into sport and coach for the wrong reasons. And then, um, 
and then we're uh, we're stuck with a, a coach who's power tripping or doing things for their ego like this. So it's a big problem, sadly, but it's um, it's it's brutal. Um, the players are so conflicted because they love their current club but feel the threat of being of losing it in high school. Well, you know, I think the solution there is like if as soon as a coach shows you this, then you get away from that coach. That's the answer. Get away from that coach as soon as you can, as far as you can, because. Um, it's brutal, and I would definitely tell administration, uh, whether it's the club or the or the school, uh, I would definitely tell administration. This is totally inappropriate. So, um, okay, this one is a longer one. Um, so basically, this post is it's an anonymous post. It's about basically the uh, daughters played with the same club in Orlando for the last five seasons. Um, so much stress and disappointment, a big amount of money. We feel relieved that that club is over soon and we'll be looking for a better option. Or sorry, with this club. Um, the A couple of red flags along the way when she was with this club. We probably should have done the move earlier, but I didn't search enough to be able to compare and see that we were paying a lot more money compared to competitors in our area. $6,000 more. Whew for a travel team, but not recruiting services. They weren't getting positional training or conditioning. They weren't getting college coaches camps or the use of some apps, quality uniforms, quality coaches. So they were paying 6,000 more and not getting what other clubs were getting. Uh, club players were getting in different clubs for less money. Yes, club volleyball is a business. It's expensive and it's growing. Uh, someone has to make money, but how can we understand the astronomical fees and not getting the service? We did an episode on uh, crazy club fees and what parents and coaches can do uh, and players to alleviate that stress. So check that episode out. Uh, club directors, please, yes, make some money. Uh, make money, but please don't take all the money from hardworking par paying parents who make a huge effort to pay your fees and keep it for you. Uh, you should do better. Uh, as my daughter said, probably grass isn't greener somewhere else, but at least it's not all brown. I have hope and we'll stay positive. Yes. So I think with this one, like, you know, honestly, the, the only way we, we, we talked about this, like, you know, how much salaries or what are the salaries of club directors and admin in a club? It's very important that parents ask these questions because it's, this is like a condo I think of, right? Like a condo board where all these parents are chipping in their money to pay for something. And I think those parents have a right to ask just like condos have meetings every every uh, year as talking about expenses and reports and I think I think clubs need to be more transparent that way and there's nothing wrong with saying you're getting a good salary if you're a club director or working in club admin but uh, you better make sure that you're get, providing the services that parents are paying for right you know, think of yourself as a you know customer service business not in terms of playing time and all that stuff but in terms of you know are you providing the elements and is it fair market value um, I think that that goes a long way to to garnering trust. And on the flip side, parents, your job is to research well. Uh, you know, this parent does admit that she didn't research well, but that's how it stops, right? Uh, it can only persist if parents don't do their research. And I don't want to say boycott, but avoid the clubs that aren't providing value for money. So, um, yeah, I think the best thing parents can do is do their research, and that's how this stops. I think uh, it, it persists by parents who keep paying the money without checking out what the other clubs are doing so um yeah that, that that's it i think it's up to parents to stop this i mean clubs can ask whatever they want but as long as someone still pays it uh then the issue will persist so i mean posts like this help of course but um reminding parents to do their due diligence before they send their kid off for like a year you know club club flies by like for parents you know who are just starting they might feel like it's forever but when it's done man you look back and you're like that was fast just like when your kids are done school or you know any stage of life yourself sometimes you look back and you're like that went fast so it it, it goes by fast so you want to make sure that uh, you don't waste a year uh, just throwing your kids somewhere that's convenient not maybe the best. So I, I would spend a little bit of time. It doesn't take much time, take an hour to research the clubs in your area, right? We have the internet now and you can uh, look up or talk to other parents and show up at practices and gyms. I mean, that might take a little more than an hour, but uh, you can do that stuff. So I, I think that's easy, easier to do now than ever. So let's, let's help get rid of the, um, you know, the expensive clubs that are, I don't want to say ripping parents off, but not, not providing good value uh, by doing our research and doing our due diligence as parents, right? And again, I'm a I'm a club owner and a, and a, a director and also a, a, a parent and a player too. So, okay. Just sorry. I need a drink of water. here. Okay. 
Sorry. Uh, without Eric here, it's just, uh, well, I thought I talked a lot, but uh, man. Um, here's a question about how do you pick between two clubs when tryouts are different weekends and they give 24 hours to make your commitment? So now th- this is a tricky one because it varies from area to area in terms of um, some places it's uh, forbidden to do this where there's more of a time limit on uh, they have they give players more time. Other players, it's sh- other places it's shorter where they, I've heard of like scenarios where they, a kid has to decide at the end of practice uh, if they want to accept an offer from a team, which is, is absolutely ludicrous. But my thinking is, okay, and this is like the idealist in me, the minute a club starts playing funky games with parents and their time and uh, makes these crazy little rules, I I, I tend to run from that. I, I, don't, I, I look really hard for another club because – we had this pop up in our in our lives too, where a club was like, so they posted their public tryouts and they didn't contradict or they didn't, um, you know, they didn't uh, conflict with an, a rival club in an area. But then at one of the tryouts, they verbally told everybody in attendance that there was they were going to throw in another tryout, and that one was going to conflict with the other club's tryout. And the minute I heard the coach say that, I said to my kid do you want to play for these toxic losers? Like, are are you that insecure as a club and your coaching quality that you're going to play these little games of forcing kids to pick and choose? Why don't you just let them go to both like a confident club, like a confident coach, and then uh, just let them pick you because you're good. Obviously, whenever, whenever a club resorts to these types of games, it tells you all you need to know about them. It tells you that they are into playing games and tricks rather than spending that time on getting better coaching. Because again, if you're truly confident as a club, you don't play that. You don't play these games, right? You just let parents go. Okay, let them go. Go see their tryout. See our tryout. See their tryout. But if they're too busy making games and not developing themselves as coaches, that's what they'll do. So I would run from a club the minute they start showing you this type of stuff. I tend to go find another one, and I know it's far. I know it's a drive, right? Some parents say, "Oh, but that one's an hour away or two hours away." I mean, you get what you get right? Like the effort you put in, just like a player, right? Like the effort you put in is uh, very commiserate or very uh, much connected to the results you get. Um, and that, that's a universal law, right? So if parents put in more effort and time into something like the club, then odds are their child is going to get a better club experience, right? So sometimes we want the easy and convenient way, and then we end up complaining about it. And I'm sorry, but that's what easy, easy, <laughs> you've heard this, right? Easy, easy life or whatever easy decisions or easy things lead to a very hard life and harder things lead to an easier life this is a true a truism sort of a, nat- a natural law of the universe that doing hard things leads to an easier life and doing easy things leads to a harder life sorry uh you can tell there's the coach in me um another question my daughter is five foot two uh this past season's club team the coach put her as middle uh, must be a very young team uh, due to the other girls being shorter with no training from coach and a few outside private lessons on her own. She held her ground and did her best. She's now going through club tryouts and the middles she's competing with are taller. And I doubt my daughter's height will not go past five foot five um, or five foot six. We have to also think about getting into middle school. Yes, so quite young, obviously. Middle school's top team. We also have to think about getting in middle school's top team and the middles she will have to compete with there. Uh, since she was pigeonholed at middle during club season, she wasn't able to experience much of, of the other positions. She is still developing her outside hitting, timing, etc. It's very tricky to switch from middle to outside hitter and vice versa. Um She is not a setter, but is decent at playing back row. She can dig well, but uh, will put body on the line and keep sets going, keep rallies going, I guess what I mean. Any advice, suggestions, tips on how we go forward? Well, okay, so this this player sounds tailor-made for one solution. Can anybody guess it? A little louder, I can't hear you. No, Uh, the answer is beach volleyball. If you live in an area where beach volleyball is possible, your daughter sounds like a prime candidate for beach volleyball for a few reasons. One, uh, if she's being pigeonholed as a middle, um, that means that she might get liberoed out 
and uh, then she'll never develop the passing skills and that will lead to when she does uh, you know if she peaks out at 5.5 five or 5.6 five, and they want to make her an outside hitter potentially or even a libero who knows um, if she's in middle school she's probably like 13 or something um, then she won't have the necessary skills so this is classic this is why we tell middles especially uh, even liberos who maybe have hopes of uh, hitting outside or something like that um, or any player really uh, to go to the beach because that is where like I said earlier in this episode you get to develop all the skills and so that day that the coach looks at your daughter or your son and says hey you're not a middle you're an outside hitter then they're not um, you know trapped with no passing skills and they will get cut because outside hitters generally especially on the left side they need to know how to pass. Um, so, and also you never know what can happen on the beach. If you're setting so much, um, who knows, maybe your setting improves and you become, your footwork improves and you become a setter indoors. Uh, also too, like remember, uh, serving on the beach can, uh, can translate into serving well indoors too. So I highly recommend that the best thing you could do if you're worried about pigeonholing is let that play out indoors, but you take care of your kid by letting them play beach where they can pass, set, hit, serve all the time and defend sound good that's my answer uh but it does suck this is an age-old problem you're not alone every every middle i know uh laments the fact that or you know a a kid that's labeled as a middle they get screwed over when they go to play post-secondary or uh, higher levels because the minute they're told they have to play outside and they can't pass they feel like they were ripped off you know um okay so i think that's uh that's about it i reached the end of my selected questions hopefully you gained some uh, knowledge from that we hope that facebook moms uh, are listening and watch this episode and uh, maybe we'll share it we'll do this periodically uh pre-select a few questions and answer them uh, on the fly uh just through the perspective of a coach and player and uh, parent as well so we think it's handy and we hope you do too and uh yeah we'll see you next time on volleyball g and stay tuned because our next episode we are going to have uh, legendary volleyball coach uh, joining us via satellite or via zoom or whatever a remote guest and uh, we're going to talk very important stuff about volleyball sort of why his mission and our mission uh, developed separately uh, and we were very happy to see that uh, he sort of arrived at the same conclusions as we did as former players and, and coaches who have uh, you know become volleyball parents so stay tuned for that and in the meantime we hope you guys have a great week and remember every wednesday we load an episode up here so we hope that you uh you can uh, listen to us it's nice and early usually on wednesday mornings and also we've noticed too that a lot of people are listening to our shows or watching our shows uh we're great on apple and you know and amazon and all these sort of and spotify too but we aren't getting the subscribers and and honestly the more subscribers we get on youtube uh the better our guests will get so keep that in mind so if you can just do us a favor even if you don't even watch us on youtube uh subscribe but if, especially if you do watch too but that because that the, like again the more subscribers we get on youtube then the more we can attract some of the bigger names that we're uh, we're starting to get uh and we are getting noticed so that's good news too uh so thanks again for listening and we'll see you next week guys bye-bye what's the big idea